the reality is the market is extremely local and you must understand the market locally based on transactions, rent rates, vacancy factors. There's so many variables that you have to look at locally in order to gauge where you are within each cycle. We all have to, as investors, adapt with the changes. Again, what, what I love about the real estate cycle and these changes, the cycle doesn't tell you when to buy. It shows you how to buy within each stage. And when you're dealing with buying commercial space, particularly office, if you understand that these are the trends, then you need to really evolve with your strategy on these properties. This episode brought to you by Suites at Madison. Meeting in conference rooms for rent by the hour, week, month, or year. Suites at Madison, where business gets done. Check them out at www.downtowntampaoffice.com. Now, on to the show. You are listening to the Invest Florida Real Estate Show, covering topics in lending, buy and sell strategies, property management, hot markets, and tips and tools to guide you along the way on your path to real estate success. You want Florida Investment Real Estate Talk? You have come to the right place. And now, our hosts, Eric Odom and Stephen Silverman. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Invest Florida Real Estate Show. This is your co-host, Eric Odom, along with Stephen Silverman. Stephen, it has been uh, very interesting here over the last couple of months. Well, it's been exciting. We've got some things going on. Um, it was exciting this week when they broke our walls down and we moved into the space next door and opened a training room. Actually enlarged the space that we have now. And uh, we have a training room that's part of uh, Suites of Madison now uh, that we had a deadline to get ready for actually a real estate investor who wanted to do a discussion, a meet and greet with their potential clients, their prospects. And we were uh, scrambling to try to get it done. The fixtures and the fittings still weren't complete, but the room was certainly ready for the uh, investor to to use and to put on a, a show for their for their clients. And you know that's obviously one of the benefits of the space is that um, that you know it's just to give people an affordable method to be able to press flesh. And you know we're in this age of technology. That gives people the opportunity to text and talk by phone and and um, have relationships beyond in person. But at the end of the day, Stephen, no one's going to invest with you until they know you, like you, and trust you. And yeah. part of that is getting in front of people and and, and look him in the eye. You know that's true. But the other part of technology, you you still need to meet and talk to people. But I was amazed how, from an investment point of view in in real estate, how technology has changed the landscape. All the Video equipment that we put in for and and connection teleconferencing, yeah. I mean, it just changes the way, the way people are communicating are so different. You know, in the past, being able to share documents and that sort of thing. If you've got a a survey, uh, it is hard. You know, you you don't know if you've got someone's big a mug on a screen at a video conference. You don't know what they're looking at, and they're trying to explain to you what a sur the survey and what the boundaries looking like. And you know, these technologies now allow you to share the screen not only with your face but also the technology to draw on the survey to show exactly where the easement is. And it's just it's it's cool. There's just a lot of stuff going on. But um, that's that's us in our world today. And, you know, it's the suites are going through some expansion and it's some stress. But at the end of the day, I think it's going to be good for uh, good for everybody. Stephen, we yeah, had we'll hit, we'll hit the sweet spot. Oh, I'm going to be happy when you go on vacation. <laughs> really? Uh, I really am. I'll bring back some jokes for you. Yeah, I'm sure you will. Stephen's going for uh, six months to South Africa and uh, you'll be back next year, right? You wish. I'm going for a week. <laughs> okay. Uh, family. Uh, no, not family. Yeah, it's, yeah, a, it's, high it's a reunion and it'll be fun. Yeah. So that's uh, that's good to be able to get away once in a while. Just wanted to, uh, before we get started with our guest, uh, wanted to read a quick review from Thinking Listener. He says, or she, we're not sure who, it's a, a man or a woman, but says, this is a very useful show. The guests are well-informed and active in the real estate industry. The hosts are entertaining without being over the top and experienced investors in their own right. Thinking listener, we really appreciate the kind words. It's very appreciated. Not only did Steve get excited when people say nice things about him, but it has a higher 
purpose and that purpose is when yeah, we- it really when we interview hosts uh, well guests and and they want to see reviews um it helps us get better guests for the show so L- please guys listen yeah like the guy today i mean he's in a he's a busy man and he needs to know that it's his time is being valuable valuably spent or it's really an investment it's an investment of his time it's why i continue to use that word when i say thanks for investing with us you are investing your time because hopefully you're getting something out of it the guests are no different and they go and they look at the reviews on the show and so thinking listener putting a review down on itunes helps us it does help us because it helps us not only with the rankings but it also helps when people are checking us out to see if we are uh, worth their investment of time to see that people are paying attention. So it's much appreciated when you guys take the time out of your busy schedule to invest in our show, because it's not just ours, it's yours too. Hopefully you're getting something out of it to leave the review and, um, and, and help everybody out in the long run. Steven, are there any other housekeeping items before we get rolling? I get really tired with housekeeping. So I think it's time to just roll into the show. Today we have with us Rick Malero. Rick is co-founder and principal of the HIS Capital Group, a collection of real estate investment and lending entities. Rick has led HIS and strategic alliances in the acquisition and creative restructuring of over $500 million in assets spanning five countries. He has also built investment portals that offer effective strategies for both novice and accredited investors. They are designed to create compelling returns. Rick is driven by his passion to level the playing field for those less fortunate using real estate to influence and feed nations. This includes providing fresh water to villages in the Sudan, supporting a school for the deaf in Dominican Republic, and also feeding thousands at home and abroad. Rick, thank you for being with us and welcome to the Invest Florida show. Thank you. I'm honored to be here with you guys. Hey, Rick. You know, you're pretty well known here in the Tampa area, actually the whole I-4 corridor. I mean, folks, um, investors know you. You're fairly young, but, but you're, but you've got a lot of experience and you've done a lot of things. How did you first get your start in real estate investing? Yeah, no, I, I joke around and tell people I started when I was three, but, uh, they don't believe that anymore with the gray hair on my head. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, no, actually, uh, when I first started, funny you mentioned Tampa because, um, I used to live in Tampa, and when I finally made a decision that I wanted to get into the real estate investment space, I started doing a lot of research, and I learned about all these gurus that can make you rich overnight, but I had to give them 50 grand, which I didn't have. And so um, I did the, the best next thing that I could do. I decided to look for a job in the Tampa Bay area, and there's a gentleman by the name of Mark who uh, was doing some flips at the time, and he was uh, I put an ad in the paper to hire an acquisitions manager. So I went and I interviewed And he very politely fired me and said, you don't even qualify. You have no experience. So my rebuttal was, you know what? I'll work for free if you'll just teach me. And so for six months, I started in the industry by interning with this gentleman and helping him make about $78,000 in profit before we started transitioning. Wow. Wow. So so how how old were you at that point, Rick? Um, I had probably just turned 21 (laughs) at that point. So were you still in school at that point or you're still or, or had you finished? No, no, no. I, I was already finished. So okay. I, I was literally at that point uh, working a kind of a night job to survive while I interned throughout the day. So I was kind of in a position that I needed to make something happen. And so I just committed uh, full, you know, 100 percent to this opportunity and I began to intern. And so what I realized as I was working for him is that I was basically wholesaling him properties, uh-huh. uh, but for free. <laughs> well, what, kind so, of, what kind of properties, Rick, were you working with him on? He was primarily back then. I mean, when, when, when I started working with him, his main goal was uh, buy, fix, flip or some rental properties. But he was mainly looking at quick turning properties. And so I kind of learned that model very quickly. And I started implementing that strategy for me. It wasn't literally till about 2006, 2007 that my company individually evolved into commercial. But uh, back then it was mainly only single family homes. And I started wholesaling properties to him. And then it just kind of grew. From there, I started working with other investors, and I kind of built a, a pretty strong wholesale business before it started becoming an actual investment company. Now, your your business has morphed, and why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, your firm now, uh, HIS, and what they're doing, and, and how you got in, into that business. What did you see that made you decide to go in that direction? And I think we should start also, um, and I, we keep asking you 500 questions and not giving you a chance to answer, but um, start with like, you know, you know, the, the acronym and, you know, you know, how it all came about and all that sort of sort of thing. 
Yeah, no, no, absolutely. I'd be, I'd be more than glad to do that. And so if you almost look at the company has gone through different stages of growth. And so in every one of those stages, we've added an additional strategy. So in the beginning, we were wholesaling properties to investors, mainly because we didn't have the capital, but we recognized the opportunity. And so what ended up happening is I wholesaled so many properties and I got to work with customers on a regular basis. So when I started seeing that these guys were making so much money buying them, when I had a little cash myself, we started buying those houses instead of wholesaling them. Okay. And so it was like a gradual transition of, hey, I'm wholesaling properties to pay the bills. Now I'm flipping a few properties to start building money. And then I started taking some of those profits and buying rental properties. So that was the initial growth. Now, back then, the company was actually called Home Investing Solutions, which is where we get the acronym for HIS. Okay. But the reason why I did that, and again, I don't want to sit here and you know, kind of uh, look like a, I'm preaching a sermon, but... I had started a business prior to that, to that name change. And I would say that was about 2004 is when I had transitioned and um, I made the company all about Rick and very quickly things started going south. So yeah. I made a decision that I was going to commit everything I did to him, that everything I did was for his glory. And so I wanted to find a name in a company that would still present that, but it would still be relevant to real estate. And so back then it became home investing solutions, which was the reminder for me to remember that it's not about Rick. It's about his glory. Gotcha. And so that's where everything began. Um, but of course, uh, we went through another phase of buying homes ourselves, fixing them and selling them, buying rental properties. And about 2006, we got to the point that we realized that residential was just one aspect of the real estate business. And if we were going to be real successful investors, we need to diversify in different projects. And so that's when we started the journey of going to commercial. Only problem is we have a company called Home Investing Solutions, which is absolutely not relevant to commercial. Right. So that's when we started transitioning the name to his and just keeping his capital. And so that was the big transition uh, for the company and the name. Huh. And so pretty much every stage of our growth, you know, we started going into some commercial, uh, started doing some multifamily, got involved into some industrial, some office space. And over time, as the market shifted, we still kept a lot of investments in residential. Uh, but in 2013, we decided to add an additional arm, which was a strategy. I never expected it to become a full business of its own. We started doing private lending in 2013, which was just a strategy to deploy some of our capital. Mm -hmm. And um, we loved it. So like this year, we're going to do about $40 million in private money in addition to all of our other projects that we're doing. Gotcha. So you're now like in terms of your business focus, are, are you still in acquisition mode on the investment side or are you primarily lending at this point? You know, one of the benefits of lending that I, I absolutely love, and I think that's why we ultimately focused on actually making this a business of its own, was the fact that, especially in a market right now where we're growing, there's a lot of competition. However, when you're the lender, everybody comes to you with opportunities. And so we're very actively buying properties. In fact, I just bought a property today uh, for our holding strategy. Uh, however, we're leveraging the lending arm to bring opportunities that either we fund them or some of these clients that come to us, they just don't, don't have the resources to transact on a bigger project. And so if it makes sense and we analyze it, then we become the buyer or we joint venture with some of them depending on their experience and seasoning. And so I, I just love the lending arm because it gives us the ability to adapt to a variety of opportunities that come to our office that otherwise we wouldn't even know it existed. And and what kinds of lending are you doing? Is it is it long-term lending? Is it is it bridge? Uh, uh, is it something that people will have the goal of just doing it for a year or two years, like hard money and then refinancing? Yeah, it's a combination. I mean, I think when we first started, it was just literally a 12-month loan. That was the first product we ever rolled out as a test. So we'd give somebody up to 80% of what they were buying the house for, um, give them 12 months, they would fix it, sell it. Uh, ever since then, we've kind of evolved. So we've added different product lines. So we do have a buy, fix, flip product uh, that specifically deals with giving them about 12 months. So it is bridge money. Uh, we have a three-year product for people that want to buy a small multifamily or maybe single family homes. And uh, basically, we give them three years from day one. So they can buy it, stabilize it, lease it out, and then ultimately refinance with an institutional group for permanent financing options. Um, then we also came out with a test, which right now we're testing a 30-year product for uh, small multifamily and single family rental properties that are already stabilized. So we've kind of added a few little layers to our business model uh, that have been extremely, uh, not only profitable for us, but lucrative in regards to giving investors opportunities to have more options uh, in the marketplace. Gotcha. So Rick, can you tell us a little bit about 
your stabilized offering when you're lending on an apartment complex that is already uh, it's you know it's it's quote unquote stabilized what does that look how does that structure look yeah i mean we have a very similar product to uh, whether it's a single family home or we're dealing with a 24 unit apartment complex the process is very very similar um, in most cases, what we've done is we've positioned ourselves to offer the funding for the acquisition. So now they've stabilized the asset. We have a payment history with our own borrower. And then now we're working on taking them out with another product. So typically the way that we structure that is we, we want to see the history of payments, which obviously if they borrowed from us, we've already got at least a year or two of payment history. We then take a look at, you know, we do an actual valuation on the property that will go out, uh, inspect the condition of the home and give us the comparable value. And we typically will go up to 65. Sometimes in some cases, we might even consider going to 70 percent. Uh, but again, that's on a special case by case basis. And we will underwrite it based on a minimum of a debt service coverage ratio of about 1.25. So basically a buck and a quarter of income to every dollar in mortgage payment. Uh, and then what we do is we typically then structure the deal, finance them out and give them a 30 year uh, mortgage. Uh, that will give them the ability now to have a lot more time with that with that asset now that it's stabilized. OK, so and, and like. Today, what would the rates look like? Can you give us sort of a range of what that would look like? I'm sure it depends on the credit quality. Yeah, no, obviously, there's going to be some qualifications, experience. Obviously, we want to make sure that they have the the strength with experience. Some credit qualifications will obviously apply for the lower rates. But typically, where we're landing, I would say our average rate right now is about eight and a quarter. Okay. Uh, Amortize over 30. Uh, It's still technically private money. Uh, So again, our underwriting guidelines are slightly more loose, if you will, more open to the asset itself as opposed to the institutionalized product. Um, But what we find in most cases, some of of our our investors that come out, they'll typically already have tried talking to a Wells Fargo or another uh, institutional lender and either have been turned down or been asked for so many documents that they come to us and that eight and a quarter is pretty strong. You know, it gives them the ability uh, to still have a very competitive a 30 year product, but now the tenants are truly paying off the mortgage where with the other loans, of course, is more of a bridge loan is interest only. Gotcha. And is there, is there a balloon in this 30 year or it's just straight 30 year? Um, we have two products. One of them is a straight 30, but to be honest with you, not a lot of people uh, ultimately accept it because it's a little bit more expensive. We have one that is about an eight year uh, and it's not a balloon. It would be just an adjustable rate. Adjustable. So rate. it gives them the ability in about eight years or so to, uh, to basically adjust, have an adjustable rate mortgage on that. So, Rick, I would assume that um, you're adjusting your loans on, on how you perceive the market. Uh, what, what is your perception of the market now? Uh, where, where are we in terms of the uh, life cycle and uh, how long of a runway do you think yeah. we have? And specifically in the central Florida market, Rick, because you, you, that's where you are. I mean, you're, I know that you started in Tampa, but you're in Orlando now. Yeah. Yeah, we pretty much finance deals all over the state of Florida. We okay. have some business in California as well. So we just to kind of give you that answer, we have an economist who actually in 2005 and six was writing articles about how the, the market was going to crash. And so in about 2010, I finally got him to agree to give us an exclusive quarterly forecast so that we would have better perspective from an expert. And so every quarter we publish a report and we send it to our investors as well. So we use a lot of that data. But in addition to looking at local data. I mean, the reality is real estate is a local business. Of course. And you have to understand the key trends that are in that market. The reality is the market is extremely local and you must understand the market locally based on transactions, rent rates, vacancy factors. There's so many variables that you have to look at locally in order to gauge where you are within each cycle. In fact, when we lend money, we run an analysis for each project and that analysis pulls all the public data. Uh, from rental income down to actually average days on the market, how much inventory versus last year. And it gives us kind of a report locally on that zip code to tell us what the risk is of that market actually declining or whether it still looks like a very uh, solid market that we can invest in. So we we do that on every single deal that we either buy or lend money on. It's just part of our philosophy because it is a local market and there are different trends that happen. Uh, Now, as far as a macro level, looking up at, you know, central Florida, Uh, We believe that we're still in the growth stage of the real estate cycle. We haven't quite reached the next stage, which is the saturation stage, which is the most dangerous stage in the cycle. Um, But I think primarily the reason why we haven't quite hit that number uh, is because of the fact that we had several years of no building going on, but population growth continued. So there's still a need in the marketplace. There's still a significant amount of baby boomers that are coming from different states and now from all over the world that are coming to central Florida. And that population growth 
is right now outpacing the inventory in the market. Uh, so we, we still feel that there's some room for growth, uh, but I'm not as optimistic as some people say in five years. I'm thinking we probably have a good 24, maybe 36 months before we start seeing some form of stabilization in the marketplace. Mm. And do you see that as well in multifamily or are you speaking mostly to uh, about single family? Well, it, it, you know, what's unique about multifamily is, you know, in the single family space, that's dead on what I believe it's, it's, it's taking place right now. And the reason why it's more volatile, again, is because people buy based on what they think it's worth. It, it doesn't have an income approach to it. Where with multifamily, that kind of gets dialed down a little bit. Um, however, you know, when you look at the different asset classes like class A property, B or C, where we're finding that there seems to be already some form of saturation is in the class A space for multifamily. We see that because the vacancy rates are going up. They're starting to have to compete with the rates as far as leasing. And so watching that, I think they've definitely started overbuilding on the residential multifamily class A space. Mm -hmm. However, the class B and C space there's a major need in Central Florida for affordable housing. I oh, mean, yeah. drastic. Yeah, yeah. Nobody, nobody's right building that. Nobody's building it. Yeah. Nobody can afford it. Nobody, nobody can figure out the riddle because if they want to go, and this is the biggest mistake I found in the private space, is a lot of investors that want to build affordable housing for multifamily even, the, the issue they have is they want to get grants and programs for the government. But by the time you get that money, the cost of that money has drastically grown and therefore now it's no longer affordable. Right. And so really to get into the private sector, that is the biggest niche that everybody's trying to solve, including us. We're working on a few programs right now ourselves to try to develop some uh, multifamily that's going to be affordable uh, in the marketplace. And so that is the biggest need. And so for that very reason, those properties are going to experience a significant amount of low <laughs> Uh, vacancy rates and a lot of demand as far as uh, tenants are concerned. Yeah. And you see in the marketplace, you start looking at the data and you see numbers pushing over 50% of household income to rent in Miami, in Tampa, in and around there in Orlando. And people say, oh, well, you know, they, they use that as a one single data point to say, look at how overpriced this is. Really has a lot to do with the fact that the proliferation of the class A space, that this, the super A space, particularly in the downtown uh, corridors of Orlando, mm -hmm. Tampa, and Miami. And they're really driving these rents up and folks can't afford it. it. It's, it just, it is what it is. I mean, we're sort of in this hyperspace area of there's just not enough out there and the folks that are you know, the worker bees in the community can't afford the, the new stuff that's, that's going in and they need space, period. So let's just pivot uh, slightly uh, because you also do commercial. Are, are you seeing the same kind of uh, conundrum with like class B, for instance, in the office arena or, or retail? You know, what's, what's been unique, you know, definitely the multifamily space is, is very unique, you know, from what we just discussed. Uh, I definitely think that uh, anyone who comes up with a solution to a, at least a, a moderate um, affordable product will be at 95, 99% occupancy rates. I, I can almost guarantee that based on yep. the demand in the marketplace. Yep. We've done all the research and that is the biggest need. Now, with regards to office space, we've started seeing that there is a transition even in the need of office space. I'm in a class B building, technically see that they've been upgrading. And I was the initial note buyer of this deal with one of my partners and we huh. sold it off to another private group. And um, back then, even when the market had crashed, that was I think 2009 and 10 where we transitioned in this investment. Now, uh, what I'm finding is the, the, the rental rates are going up. So the cost is going up in the downtown Orlando market, just like in the Tampa market. I've seen that as well. Yep. But what I'm finding is that the terms are trend, they're, they're changing because I believe that there's such a revolution with having multiple employees that don't work in the office. That's like becoming a major trend. And so a lot of corporate offices are trying to downsize or not commit as long. And so they're requesting, for example, in the office space, it was traditional to expect a minimum of a seven year term. Uh, some tenants are even coming here saying, can I have three? I don't want to overcommit. Um, so we're finding that a lot of these companies that are expanding, they're trying to find non-traditional means to to work and have an office space because they don't need as much square footage as they used to need. And so that's becoming an issue for, uh, you know, office space, if you will, landlording because that that's a major that's a major transition. I mean, most people now have they're investing more in technology that can track the employee online so they don't have a bigger cost. 
And that way, if, you know, it, it's, it's really unique. It, it's something that I've, that I've seen that or a lot of shared workspace is becoming kind of the norm. Because again, people want to offset those costs. Steven, so, I think uh, I think it's important for us at this point to say we really did we set Rick up on this. <laughs> we did not. I think, I think he might have subconsciously set you up. No, but no I, I'm you know, but <laughs> but it's interesting to me also because I see a, a, like in multifamily a ton of Class A office space still coming up in the market, and mm-hmm. there's been real really no building of of office space in the, in the B area, but people are changing, and we started. Um, our suites at Madison, which is collaborative space with conference rooms and executive offices and, um, and shared desk and, and, and training rooms and training and, rooms and, and all that sort of stuff in Tampa. So it's, I, I the listeners that, are, that listen regularly to the show, they hear us uh, pontificate on office space like this all the time. So they're going to laugh and say, uh, Eric and Steven set Rick up to basically pimp <laughs> their suites at Madison. And I, I need to disclaim this, that no, we did not set you up. You just volunteered to say that information, right? <laughs> no, absolutely. I mean, it's a trend. I mean, that's, and, and we all have to, as investors, adapt with the changes. Yeah. Again, what, what I love about the real estate cycle and these changes, the cycle doesn't tell you when to buy. It shows you how to buy within each stage. Right. And when you're dealing with buying commercial space, particularly office, if you understand that these are the trends, then you need to really evolve with your strategy on these properties because there are some property owners here that could really make a killing by streamlining their actual product in the marketplace based on the current market demands. And um, so it, it's definitely a unique business model right now. Uh, but a lot of the old school guys that are used to those, you know, 10,000 minimum square feet being leased and so forth and a minimum of 10 years, they're going to be sitting there vacant for a little while. Uh, until they actually adapt to these changes. Yeah, I mean, you really, that's the name of the game. The workforce has continued mm-hmm. to grow and the office space market has not. And that has to do with sending the workers home. I can, we'll just sort of add our own uh, bits and pieces on that. We just mm-hmm. added a training room uh, to our facility. Um, it just opened this week. Uh, we're still trying to put the fixtures and finishings uh, on it as we speak. But it it was down to we, uh, there's a large insurance company actually that sent all their salespeople home about mm, five or six years ago. What they noticed was that the productivity went down, and salespeople are highly motivated by their revenue model, uh, what's in their pocket. But what ends up happening is that even the most driven salesperson, if they're not in, they're competitive people tend to be salespeople, deal makers tend to be competitive people. And so if they're just isolated and on the on the road all the time, they don't have that motivation every day to go out and, and compete with the guy next to them because they're not sharing that office space or working from home. Right. But they asked us to add on the training room to be able to get regular meetings with larger groups. So hence that we did it. But we we call them boomerangs because they sent everybody home and then they realized that wasn't such a great idea either. There has to be some sort of median uh, and, and this is why we started Suites was to essentially service those folks that were home that now need um, to, to have some sort of collaborative space to meet and, and, and share ideas about how a deal was done or, or, or uh, create the next widget, or whatever it might be. Steven himself is a boomerang. Uh, he worked from home and would, would not come into downtown. And now I... I try to get him to leave and he doesn't leave. He just stays here. So, <laughs> well, I was just thinking that some of our tenants are like boomerangs. Uh, they, you know, they, they yeah. send a check and then we have to send it back. So it's, <laughs> or the bank sends yeah, it back. Yeah, it's a conundrum. It really is. I mean, we have the same issue. Uh, yeah. we, um, are, we've out, completely outgrown our space. If all of our staff were here full time, we'd probably need another 3,000 square feet. Right. But what we've done is again, we, we've converted some of our office space into more of collaborative space so they can come in and out and they come to the team meetings. They, you know, they're interacting, but then they're back on the road doing what they have to do in order to get the business. And so uh, that that is a complete change because technically a company like mine would have needed at least a couple thousand square feet more. And we'd have to lock this in for 10 years where well, we're not. Mm. Now we're just being very creative with how we use the space. And so uh, those commercial landlords have to really start considering how to appeal to these particular businesses that they're doing a lot of business. They're just doing different. Yeah. Uh, strategies now. And so they have to accommodate that in order to get their occupancy rates up. And uh, there's a lot of great things that they can do is just, again, some are figuring it out and many are not. But mm-hmm. at some point, that'll become the norm. But that's definitely a trend to look out for, for sure. So, Rick, let, just let's go down memory lane a little because you said something mm-hmm. interesting uh, a short while ago about your economist in 2006 predicted that we were going to have a, a bust. Uh, 
how how did you deal with that how did you go through the market that that we all suffered from yeah and then and then what yeah. what what how did everybody came out of this thing with scars and <laughs> so your your scars how did they heal and how did it manifest like how did it shape your business philosophy oh man uh, let me first tell you that we came out of it very slowly and painfully <laughs> Um, but the reality is, and I have to make a really, really important note here. It wasn't until the crash that I realized that I was only half investing. I didn't realize that I wasn't really an investor until the market tested me and it showed me all the weaknesses that we had. And there was a lot of business that we were doing that was very transactional. And that's the one thing I want to kind of make a comment for any investor out there. It's okay to be transactional to get to the point where you have enough revenue to invest, but you're not really an investor. So you have an actual portfolio of diversified investments because the objective of being an investor is to let your money do the work so you don't have to. Mm -hmm. That market shift really showed me that about 90% of everything we did was very transactional. Very few was actually passive investments that were grounded on the fundamentals of income producing investments. And so I, I've got to give it credit. I was speaking at an event in 2006 I was one of the keynote speakers. There were hundreds of people there, and I was almost just bragging about how well we were doing. Um, afterwards, I was introduced to a gentleman who's probably back then 68, 70 years old, wearing a, a little Hawaiian shirt. I'll never forget that. Uh. And um, so, so he walked in. He, you know, he was introduced to me, and he, he asked me what I did. And, and so I said, "Oh, you didn't hear what I talked about?" And he's like, "No, I just got in." So of course, I spent 30 minutes telling how great I was, and he finally said, "Oh, so you work for tips?" <laughs> And uh, aside from the fact that I was furious, he started asking me some questions that literally broke me down completely. One of them was actually, if you got ill and you were not able to push the business, would your business continue at or equal to basically or more of the, of the volume you're doing? And the answer was really no. Maybe 50% of productivity would drop if I was sick. Yep. Then he said, if the market crashed and there was no more lending for your particular business, would you be able to sustain yourself with passive revenue? And the answer was absolutely not. And up until that time, I didn't even think of cycles. And so after meeting him, it really challenged me to look at it. And I asked him what he did. He, he owned several commercial properties. He definitely had done it the slow way, but he had a lot of income coming in passively. And so 2006, we transitioned to get into some commercial. So by 2017, we had a couple of commercial projects. And when the market crashed, those were the only projects that saved us. Huh. And so for me, it's become a complete philosophy. I call it my 40, 40, 20 plan, but this is really kind of our objective. We look at at least 40% of everything we do. The question is, does it produce passive revenue, passive income that's safe? So whether that's small multifamily, we have a couple of industrial projects in Ireland, uh, whether it's even lending, lending still falls in that bucket because I lend the money. And if, even if it's three years, that secures me a pretty nice return on my money every single month that I don't have to go out there and work for it. And then I have the other 40%, which is what we call appreciating assets. Now, that over the years has evolved. It used to be flips. Uh, we still do flips and we still build properties. But now, I mean, I just not too long ago bought a mortgage in a 300-unit apartment complex in, uh, in Georgia. We bought the mortgage at $675,000. That was in default. The face value was like 1.1. ,1. And uh, we started foreclosure. I was so excited because it was going to go to auction uh, the next day. I had valued the commercial property at 3.4 million. So I really wanted this deal to work. <laughs> um, but the day before the auction, we got a payoff request. We ended up getting paid out 1.275, which included my legal fees. And, you know, we made a really good return on that money, even though I was crying collecting the check because I wanted the building. But, um, but th that's another example of what I would call where you bought appreciation. So commercial debt that is uh, distressed and in default is something we look at sometimes. Building projects, of course, fits in there that as long as it's got some fundamentals. And then the 20% is what I call the higher risk, high reward. And that might be looking for opportunities, maybe even overseas or projects that are just, you know, incredible potential. But, you know, it, it's going to take some work and effort and it could take five, 10 years before this thing ultimately kicks off what you want. And so that's the way we look at it. We look at where does this project fit? Does it fit in the cash flow? Does it fit in my appreciating bucket? Uh, or does it fit in my higher risk, high reward? And that's been the philosophy that we've implemented for for years now. I, I was just going to say, you know, I, I we've talked to our investors all the time about fitting into buckets, and I've never really heard it in this way before. But it definitely helps sort of bring it into focus for me because you know, we talk to our investors about we'll put it in a, in a different bucket. You want as many buckets as possible, but we never really define what those buckets are. So this is an interesting way. The forty sort of 
the, the cash flow uh, uh, portion, 40, the capital appreciation, and then the 20, the speculative. And it covers all those areas that, you know, the downturn is going to help you, the upturn, you're going to be making money out of this. Uh, and then the speculative, you can really hit the ball hard in, in that. It's sort of your VC uh, money. An interesting concept, exactly. right? Thank you. Yeah, that, that's, that's been our philosophy. And that's really what's changed the way we do business. Uh, and also, again, just tying in also our philanthropic endeavors. You know, it used to be a checklist item that I had. Like, hey, you know, at the end of the year, if we do good, we'll write a nice check and say thank you. Uh, but we've made that a part of our culture. Like now every deal we do has a face on it. And you will be amazed that not only our investments are producing better, our staff morale is through the roof. Huh. And it's because they understand that doing business with a purpose, we call it investing with purpose. I'm actually finishing a book right now about that. It, it's incredible how it's transformed the way that our team operates because they know that every deal makes a difference. And I cannot emphasize how powerful that strategy has been, uh, almost if not better than that 40-40-20 plan that we've implemented. Interesting. So what is a good deal for Rick? You know, a good deal right now on our lending arm, you know, we look for, you know, any opportunity really that we can lend that fits within our guidelines. Uh, currently for Rick, uh, I am in the uh, in the space. I would have to almost break it down in, <laughs> into the boxes. For the cash flow right now, uh, we are in the process of looking for a potential project that may or may not come together that we're still negotiating, which would potentially become 288 quads out of Kissimmee. Uh, the reason why we're excited about that is because it is going to be a, a relatively affordable product uh, in the marketplace. And we know there's a huge demand for it. Uh, so I'm looking for those kind of income potentials uh, for our holding entity. Um, when it comes to commercial, honestly, um, we look at just about any opportunity and make sure as long as it's got some sound opportunities. Uh, we just, for example, we're analyzing a deal that had about 40,000 square feet of industrial space with 32 acres in the complex that have not been developed yet. I look for those kind of opportunities because I typically try to buy it as close as I, as I can to the income of those buildings and then we develop the, the back end of it. And that's really where we create the equity. So I'm looking for those value add opportunities uh, as well. What, what would you tell investors in this market right now? I know you already said that you believe that we're still in growth phase. Again, from a macro perspective, each one of the individual submarkets or a micro market unto its a microcosm unto itself. But mm -hmm. um, what would you tell either first time investors or newer investors how to navigate the waters right now? Because we are in terms of asset class pricing. Uh, fairly high. So, so can mm -hmm. maybe give some ideas of what, you know, if Rick, you're talking to 20, 20 year old Rick, what would you say to him uh, about this market? Yeah. So here there's pros and cons to this market. You know, I, I joke about it in my office and I hope it doesn't offend anybody, but during this stage, even a fool can make money. And that's a good thing. And that's also a bad thing. Cause that means that there's a lot of speculators that are jumping into the marketplace because uh -huh. now it's trendy. It's the cool thing to say, I'm an investor. Now, with that said, that means that there's a lot of profit potential opportunity. So what I would tell investors, or I would even tell myself, uh, and I'm actually stealing this from, from another source, I'll, I'll tell you in a minute what it is. But what I would say is during the good times, the very first thing that you need to do is have a game plan of where you want to be. You know, what is that passive revenue that you want to develop? How much profit do you need in order to set aside money? So I would put a plan uh, to say, okay, for the next couple of years, Here's my goal of how much money I want to generate in profit that I'm going to stack away. And I would start saving. I would literally start putting money in a savings account specifically for the purpose of reinvesting in passive. Okay. And I would obviously make a plan to, to just push forward, make as much profit as I can. But anything that I hold, I'm going to look through a microscope. I'm going to really go into it to make sure, hey, is this project, is it going to be strong enough if the market corrects itself? Can I hold this deal for 10 years? If the answer is no, then I'm not going to put it in my hold pile. I'm going to try to get rid of it as quickly as I can if there's a profit to be made. Uh, so I would tell people, first of all, set a game plan of how much money you want to store. Start storing now during the good times so that when the bad times come, you have the resources to capitalize on the opportunity. So that would be one key lesson. The second key lesson that I would tell people is if you already have assets, if you don't have anything, then the answer is just don't get in too much debt. You know, don't go too crazy going out there borrowing. There's people out there that every now and then lend money beyond what they should. Uh -huh. uh, and a lot of investors think that's that's great. That is the dumbest thing you can do is to get over leverage on investment. So if you don't have any assets, just don't over leverage. If you do have assets, then instead of over leveraging those assets, 
what you need to do is allocate a percentage of the revenue you make if it's rental property. So for example, if you have 10 homes, take 80 to 90% of what you make net on those homes and apply it to some of these properties to pay them off. Let your tenants pay off these properties as quickly as possible. Uh, we, we literally are doing that right now with some of our properties that we borrowed from investors on. Mm-hmm. Our goal right now during the good time is to pay off as much debt as we can, save as much money as we can. So when the market transitions, we are positioned to truly capitalize on the future opportunities that are coming. And so uh, I'd like to tell you that I'm just brilliant and that that's a strategy that I've actually uh, done. But actually, yeah. I'm stealing that from the very first correction that I've studied, which is actually in the Bible. Uh, in the book of Genesis. And actually, that's where <laughs> Pharaoh had that dream. And um, he put a guy that was smart enough to say, you know what, during the good times, let's set aside some of these great opportunities that we have. Let's store in the storehouse. And when the market shifted, they were able to consolidate all of that wealth into one Pharaoh. There used to be multiple Pharaohs back then. It was almost like you know different states in Egypt. And those states were very wealthy. Uh, but this particular pharaoh became number one and the highest above all because he was able to position himself during the right time. Huh. And it was all about re- preserving resources and putting those systems in place. And so I would absolutely tell every investor today, save money, put a plan to put money aside. And if you have debt, put a plan to pay it off so that you're perfectly positioned for the future opportunities that will come. Good advice. So how do you find your deals? Um, that's a great question. Obviously, lending has really made me lazy because I, I will say we have a lot of clients that come to us with opportunities that we don't have to advertise. But we also do have about a marketing budget of about $6,000 a month that we spend sourcing for private opportunities. And meaning we don't look at the MLS. We don't look at LoopNet. Uh, we will target certain markets when we're looking for opportunities, direct mail them, have a team that actually will call them and telemarket them. Uh, funny enough, those guys work from home. And uh, their job is to bring opportunities to our acquisition manager who will look at it, run the numbers, and make an offer for us. And so that's one of the most effective ways that we have been finding opportunities, uh, either through our borrowers or through our own direct mail telemarketing campaigns uh, that have really uh, shaken up some markets. In fact, St. Pete has been incredible doing that. Mm. There's a lot of guys that own some multifamily property there that are just in the retirement stage. They really haven't kept the property up and they would just rather sell it at a discount and cash out. So we, we've talked to a lot of those guys over there. Yeah, there's a lot of those little apartment complexes over in St. Pete. I think it's the densest of multifamily market in, in, Florida. Number, in Florida. Yeah, yeah, literally. It's a, it's an amazing, it's an amazing place, yeah. especially if you buy it right and you can then improve the asset. The demand is there for affordable housing again. And so you just positioned yourself for some good opportunities. Yeah. So yeah, so that that's how we do it. Off market is one of our focus, and then, of course, our borrowers. Awesome. So, Rick, if someone's got a deal for you on the lending side or on the buy side, how, how would they get in touch with you? Yeah, I mean, they can go to hiscapitalgroup.com, um, and on the website, uh, there's there's a, a portion of our website that talks about loans. So if they want to get loans, they can go there and just inquire. Um, if they want to show us an opportunity for investment purposes, um, there's a contact page. Just contact us there. One of our team members will get back to you within 24 hours, and then we'll review the opportunity. Uh, and then kind of, you know, guide you through what we need in order to make a decision if it fits. And and one question before I let you go, and I know this mm-hmm. is going to be something that is close to your heart. And investing with a purpose is a big part of what you guys do, not as just you know, individually, but you as a, you and your and his and his capital. So why mm-hmm. don't you tell us uh, just briefly about some of the projects that you're working on uh, that are really warming your heart? Yeah, no, absolutely. So, um. There, there's three key projects we've been working on. One of them is in Ukraine. We're trying to help um, with dealing with – there's a major issue there with human trafficking. And so we've kind of been working with some organizations there to develop programs to to help uh, prevent it, but also to get inside of those places where we can take those kids from those cages because some of them are actually in cages like animals. Jesus. Uh, so that's very near and dear to my heart because some of those those children are the, the age of my daughter. Right. And so that that's been one thing that we've invested in. Um, affordable housing is a crisis. We have a lot of, uh, veterans coming back that become homeless. Uh, so we're working on a project currently to potentially build about 260, uh, units of an apartment complex out of shipping containers using soldiers, uh, to help build them. So, so that's one we're working through right now. We're just getting the final details. And, um, the last one, actually, I was just thinking about it the other day. I I flew to Ireland to check on one of our projects like three weeks ago and I was looking out of the window 
And it just dawned on me, here I am in business class, but in about six months, I'm going to be on a flight to a completely different place in Uganda. And so the reason why we're getting involved in Uganda this year uh, is because there's a little area where there's a lot of refugees uh, that have li- literally lost everything because of the civil war and everything else go- that's going on there. Um, because of the famine in the area and the fact that there is no food and no supply, close to 2,500 people are dying every single day. That's like a 9-11 airplane crash every day. Jeez. It's unbelievable. And, and the problem is people that have tried to put together a distribution center for resources, the moment they do that, the rebels come in and destroy them and take all the food and resources for their army. Mm-hmm. And so we're working with an organization uh, called Feeding Children Everywhere, and we're in the process of putting the money together to basically get about 300,000 meals. July 14th and 15th, our entire office, along with many other people, are going to join forces in, our, uh, in a building near, near us, and we're going to pack 300,000 meals to ship. And then in August or September, I'm not sure when it arrives, uh, some of our team members in our office are going to join local assets there. We're going to fly there and we're going to hand deliver the food to the actual people in need. So it's almost like a shock and awe mission. We figured if we can't do a distribution center, let's at least show up there, start passing food there and see if we can make way there. And so that's one of the projects that really is is heavy in my heart right now that we're, we want to be a part of making a difference. Mm. Sounds great, Rick. Really, uh, that's those are some... Terrific motivations. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure I can understand why the staff would get excited about uh, feeling like it's a higher purpose at the, at the firm and what you guys are doing. Uh, you know, sometimes with investing, it, it um, you know, the, the dollars and cents are nice and it keeps food on the table and a roof over the head. But sometimes it can't be the, mo- the, uh, the most motivating thing for everybody and particularly the employees. I could certainly understand how they could get in and, and work a little harder and feel a little bit better about what they're doing, that they, there's actually some things that you guys are working on. Yeah, it's awesome stuff, Rick. And I really take my hat off to you for, for doing all that. Thank you. No, I appreciate that. Yeah, no, I think it's just a journey for all of us, you know, for transitioning from existing to, uh, to literally living with purpose. And so that, that's our goal is we want to build significance in the industry. And we believe that making a difference while making money is the formula. So thank you for the opportunity, guys. Okay, no, Rick, any, Rick. Any, anything else before we let you go? No, just really that, you know, for anybody else in the industry, whether you're in residential, commercial, you know, the next couple of years are going to be a fantastic opportunity for you to position yourself if you're wise. So just take heed of what's going on in the marketplace. Don't blow your money. Most of the people who lose everything is because they over encumbered their assets and got over leveraged and they didn't save. Uh, if you really are disciplined during this growth stage, when the market shifts, I am telling you, you will have some opportunities that you never imagined possible. But that only happens if you have the resources to do it. Yep. And so it's imperative that, you know, if there's anything you got from this is make sure that you do that and make sure that your business revolves around making a difference, because I'm telling you, it will change your entire business. Awesome words. Rick, really appreciate the time that you invested with us today. Stephen, anything else? Uh, thanks, Rick. I really enjoyed it. Appreciate it, Rick. Thank you so much, guys. Take care. And that was Rick Malero from his capital. Stephen, what uh, what were you two, your two cents from a uh, very intelligent guy, man, entrepreneur from really a young age? What what were your thoughts? Well, I, I thought that some of the some of the thoughts that he gave were were really amazing. You know, first of all, it, I stopped and you stop and think if you get sick or if the market crashed. Um, how how are you going to continue? And um, I loved his formula, 40% um, to uh, produce p- passive income, 40% in appreciating assets, and 20% just to take a shot at doing something. And then finally, just common sense, in good times, save, like just be like Pharaoh. You know, the 40-40-20 is something I, I've voiced that to my clients in different ways in the past. I've never heard it defined in that way. And I think it's, he's given me a tool to be able to talk to people uh, a little bit better about, I would always, my, my comment was always, if somebody would bring me a deal, well, you need to have deals in different buckets. It could be 
from a tax deferred uh, versus tax advantaged versus uh, traditional investment. And this way you can sort of make return in different ways and protect yourself from this tax standpoint, but also from whether it be a traditional cash flow investment or it be a capital appreciation or speculative investment. And we talk in kind of vague terms of, you know, well, you might be getting too much speculative or you might be getting too much cash flow. Let's try to do, you're young, let's do a little bit more aggressive investing. But the whole idea of the 40, 40, 20, people will actually understand that 40% goes into that more passive, then there's nothing passive in real estate. Let's get that straight. But you understand what I'm saying. It's it's more conservative investments that should be able to cover your expenses in the downtime. And then when you get that bucket filled first, then you're able to get to be a little bit more aggressive on the, the you know filling the other buckets. And then as you move forward and you fill these buckets, you're at 40, 40, 20. This is something that I can really take to the folks that invest with us and explain it to them rather than the random fill a bucket, fill another bucket. I think this is a really good framework for me to be able to explain what I mean by that. So, but he's a smart guy. I mean, he's done a lot of things. Obviously, he's um, very organized to be able to handle, have as many balls as he has in the air and done as much as he's done in a very short period of time. So we definitely appreciate have him having on the show. And, and there's another little component, how much he gives back. I mean, I, I thought it's not that little. was- yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I think that was fantastic. Well, you think about it and that many times money is not necessarily a motivator for your staff. If you have some higher reason why they're coming in the door every day and they feel good about that, it can help them to push a little bit more because they understand that a piece of this is going, you know, it's it's not just uh, for uh, a greed. There's a common good for what they're doing and why they're showing up every day. So I think it's, you know, I, just, I know that Rick is trying to do this for altruistic purposes, but certainly there it has the byproduct of being motivational for the staff as well. So, um, you know, great, great ideas there. Stephen. Rick was a great guest today. Where can we find other guests that are great? We have other terrific guests, and you can go to our website, www.investfloridashow.com. Also, download the mobile app on your mobile device and listen while you're driving or in the gym. Guys, as always, we appreciate the time that you invest with us each and every episode. And until next time, hasta la vista. You've just listened to the Invest Florida podcast with Eric Odom and Stephen Silverman. Join us every week for actionable real estate investment ideas. And of course, visit our website at www.investfloridashow.com for more shows and tips on how to earn a cash flow in the real estate market in Florida. While hosts and producers of the Invest Florida show have no reason to doubt the validity of comments of our guests, we do not warranty their accuracy. Please check with your legal, financial, and tax advisors before entering into any investment. Returns will vary from person to person and deal to deal based on unique circumstances. All information expressed in this show is for educational purposes only. Opinions of the guests are not necessarily shared by the hosts and producers of the Invest Florida Show.